longtime NFL reporter, 26 years with the mothership, based in Dallas, and he's covering college football with Deion Sanders over the weekend. Ed Werder joining us on the program. What happened? They didn't have enough reporters to go see Deion's debut and you got to go? Well, I, you know, I live 40 minutes away and, you know, budgets being what they are, Dave. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, they wanted to see what kind of range I had journalistically, mm. whether I could cover college football and pro football. And I, I do know Dion. Um, and and uh, maybe that was the reason we had a problem. I don't know. Okay. Help me understand here what you wrote that Dion referred <laughs> to. Now, once again, uh, Marvin, can we play the clip where Ed's being singled out by Deion Sanders? What's up, boss? You believe now? You, you, hold on, hold on, hold on, oh no. Do you believe now? Huh? Oh no, no, no. I read through that bull junk you wrote. Down. I read through that. I sipped it through all that. Yeah. Oh no. Come on. Do you believe? You don't believe. <laughs> you just answered it. You don't believe. Next question. All righty. What was the bull junk that you wrote, Ed? Well, well, first of all, you know, in the moment, it just did not seem journalistically appropriate in that situation for me to meet his demand and tell him that I believed it and whether I do or I don't. Uh, and, and interacting with him, as I mentioned, you know, over the years, he played for the Cowboys, played a long time in the NFL as a Hall of Fame player. And interacting as often as we have, I can't imagine that he really expected that I was going to commit to either position in that circumstance. Circumstance because it was unprofessional to do so. Uh, fortunately, he realized it wasn't going to happen, and eventually he moved on without taking my question because if he was intent on wait, waiting, we'd still be there. But I don't really understand why did it matter? Um, you know, in that moment, after all he and his sons and his coaching staff and his players had accomplished, why did he so for me to dismiss my obligations to be fair and objective and commit to Dion so that? He would entertain my question. Um, as for you know, your question, I, I really don't know. I haven't been a writer in 30 years. I don't cover college football. This was an exception. Um, I asked him, as you heard multiple times, what did I write? And he couldn't ever provide an example. And the reason is no such example exists. Uh, I've been doing television for the last 30 years. I'm almost exclusively a TV reporter, as you know. Uh, now I am active on social media, and some people have pointed to a Twitter post I had in March in which I said this exactly. Colorado's celebrity football coach has made CU Buffs football the most interesting program in the country. It's number two in merchandise sales. Folsom Field suites are sold out and season ticket renewal rate stands at 97%. Deion Sanders has created attention before his first win. How did that, how does that somehow make me a doubter? But, um, but he's using you as – you were a prop. It didn't matter who was there for ESPN. They would have been a prop. You're the face of ESPN, and he's calling out ESPN. He's calling out a group, and you just happen to be the person who was there representing ESPN. That would be my, my take on this. He didn't want to hear what was fact. He was performing. True. You know, and I think one of the things, sadly, that's happened in – in the media business now, and I think it plays into this type of reaction is you can almost argue there are more, there are more former athletes in the media now than actual professional reporters. And so these players have a tendency, I think, to praise one another, uh, whether deserved or not. And so that leads in a situation like this, if he's referring to my tweet, where somebody sees something um, that's not overwhelmingly positive and instead it feels negative in the context that they're used to. I mean, if that tweet is what came off, and maybe you're right, maybe maybe it was more who I was working for. Yeah. Uh, although, I, as I mentioned, you know, I've covered Dion for a long time and we've had a complicated history. We've had moments where we got along great. and He helped me do my job and consented to sit down interviews. And we've had moments where it wasn't so wonderful. And, and during the Terrell Owens situation, he... He asked, as a commentator for NFL Network at the time, why couldn't I be the one who was lying instead of T.O. being the one who was lying? So I don't know if you're right. I think it's entirely possible. I also think it is possible that he was overly sensitive to this tweet where I referred to him as a celebrity coach, although I don't know how he doesn't think he's a celebrity. He would be offended if you told him he was not a celebrity, wouldn't he? 
<laughs> I wouldn't take it personally. I don't know if you are, even though he made I, it I, personal. To me. I mean, I've had, I've had a million things worse happen to me after a press conference or in a professional situation where I'm reporting on something. I've been, you know, I've had players threaten to kill, have me killed. Not do it themselves, of course. They contract it out. Um, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. What what happened where a player said, I'll have you killed, or in so many words? Well, I referenced the uh, Terrell Owens situation. I reported uh, at ESPN that Terrell Owens had become a toxic influence in the Cowboys locker room uh, and that they were going to consider after the season releasing him, even though they would have to take a $10 million cap hit. And he was undeniably one of their best offensive players. Um, but it had become an issue with certain players, including Tony Romo and Jason Witten and some members of the coaching staff. And I reported that. And the next day I went out to the locker room because that's what you do when you're a real reporter is you go out and see if anybody wants to take issue with you. Uh, T.O. would not talk to me before I published the story and he didn't want to talk to me then. But other players were highly upset and Tank Johnson, being one of them, threatened to kill me and said he was going to send some people to my house. And he, he asked me, Dan, he asked me, where do you live? And I said, Tank, if you're going to kill me, I'm not going to make it that easy. Like, you're going to have to do a little work here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so, do you, so this do you... was a guy, he, he had seen his bodyguard killed in front of him not long before. He had he had done jail time for weapons offenses and having, you know, dog fighting and all this other stuff. So he was entirely capable of it, in my opinion. It's the only time in my life, Dan, I ever got a gun to defend myself. I didn't ever need to use it, but... And Tank and I got along fine after that, but I took him seriously in the moment. <laughs> Did you call police, security? Like, I mean, no, I didn't. It's like this. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I, I went. I didn't tell the Cowboys PR people. I didn't go to the league. Uh, I went to their security person quietly and said, "Hey, just so you know, and if there's anything you can do to defuse the situation in case he's serious, you know, here's what happened." And we, they took care of it quietly if they did anything. He never did anything as far as I know. And then a few months, a few years later, <laughs> I called the league office for something. They said, you know, Tank works in the league office down just right down the hallway from Roger. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I, head of security there for the commissioner. <laughs> wow. We're Rod talking interested in, in all the dis debates and discussions that they had about discipline and, and tried to help him out. We're talking to uh, Thug Life Ed Werder joining us on the program. Uh, he'll be uh, covering the Kansas City Chiefs and the uh, Detroit Lions. Back to his regular job. The Lions there on Thursday night. Um, with the Chris Jones situation, how possibility of he could actually be back in camp? Any chance he could play in this game? You know, it doesn't seem like it from, from the people I've talked to on Andy Reid's staff since I got to Kansas City it seems like they're prepared to play without him as, as they should be at this point. I mean, you're almost 48 hours from the game. He hasn't been with the team in any capacity this off season. So it'd be hard to imagine as great as he is that he could come in and play a significant number of snaps. I mean, maybe, I don't know, but I don't think they they're close to resolving the contract situation that would lead to that outcome anyway. So I think Spagnuolo is going to have to figure out another way to take on the Lions offense. I hope the Lions keep this close um, because I don't want this to be, oh, uh, you know, everybody's all in on the Lions. And then, you know, the fact that the NFL said, I mean, the NFL has to believe in the Lions being good, right? To, to have that as the opening night. Um, are you a believer in the Lions being a legitimate, I'm not going to say playoff team, more than a playoff team this year? Well, I, I think with, you know, the state of the Packers being what they are. And given how the Lions played at the end of last season, they won, what, eight of their last 10 games. Uh, I think they were fifth or sixth in the league in offense and scoring. So they have that capacity to put points on the board and win games. I think Jared Goff, this will be a great format for him, an opportunity. You know, he threw 29 touchdown passes last year, but only six came on the road. Um, and so he's got to be better, more consistent than that if the Lions are going to fulfill what they think are, are attainable goals this season. But, yeah, I think the Lions can play. I think the interesting part of this, you know, without, without Chris Jones, that obviously makes it more important for the Chiefs to be able to score. And, and a lot of people are questioning again, well, they lost, you know, 
uh, some receivers and, and McCole Hardiman and uh, Schuster Smith. But, you know, Patrick Mahomes was the, the rare quarterback who prevailed in that situation last year. He lost Tyreek Hill and where Aaron Rodgers struggled without Devontae Adams and Dak Prescott led the league in interceptions without Amari Cooper and Ryan Tannehill had a miserable season without A.J. Brown. You know, he lost Tyreek Hill, arguably the best of all those receivers, and went out and still led the league in scoring and total offense and won another Super Bowl. So he's proven that he's able to overcome a lot of adversity that maybe other quarterbacks can't. Why will this year be different for the Cowboys? I don't know what you mean by that. They've won 12 games two years in a row. Under Mike <laughs> How about Carter. the postseason? <laughs> why will why will the postseason be different for the Cowboys? I don't know if it will be. No, um, you know, I, I think they're a really talented team. I spent a week with them at training camp. Uh, this is one of the most talented teams I think the Cowboys have ever had. Dak Prescott's pretty much had good teams every year. You know, as Troy Aikman said, I think the thing they haven't done for a long time is they haven't played their best football against the best opponents in the postseason. Um, and, and certainly the 49ers are, you know, uh, an ominous uh, opponent because of how well they play defense and they shut the Cowboys down two years in a row in the playoffs and eliminate them. And I think that's why Mike McCarthy's calling the plays now. And I think Mike feels really that he can really make a contribution in that way. And I think he and Dak have a great relationship. And if, uh, you know, I, I don't think Dak Prescott, I mentioned he led the league in interceptions. I think that's the aberration. I don't think he had an interception problem, Ben. I think he had a wide receiver problem. And I think it's a wide receiver problem they've taken care of with the acquisition of Brandon Cooks. Your Super Bowl pick is what? Uh, my Super Bowl pick is uh, I picked the Eagles and the Bills with the Bills prevailing. Oh, all right. Are you covering any more of Deion Sanders' games this season? <laughs> Not that I know of. I, uh, nobody from Bristol has called and asked if I'm available to go to Boulder and cover the Cornhuskers this week. You should just show up, you know, just – no credential, just show up, just go into the press conference there and let him call you. Dion, I have a question. No, I've had a question for a week that I'd like to ask. How I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Dion, you didn't answer this question from last week. Uh, I showed up to see if you'd answer it uh, this week. Uh, yeah, I know you're keeping receipts. Ed, I'm glad you're alive. I'm glad you're Please. you know able to cover the uh, games and uh, didn't get hurt in the process of any of this. So uh, we're all grateful for that. Well, thanks for having me on, Dan. Good to talk to you as always. That's Ed Werder. Ed Werder has more. ESPN NFL reporter based in Dallas. 26 years with the mothership, and uh, he'll be covering the Thursday night NFL opener, the Lions and the Chiefs.